We'll get started here in a few minutes. Thank you. Find a seat, please. That's not, that's not going to work. I'll take up. Then I'll lose them. Everybody quiets right down when you do that. Well, good afternoon. Welcome to South Dakota. Welcome to Sioux Falls. Thank you so much for being here. And this is the opening session for the 20th William T. Pecora Remote Sensing Symposium. Just for everyone's sake, Please find the fire exit nearest to you. We have to do safety. Make sure you know where you are. Restrooms are out and to the left if you, uh, if you need them. And please uh, silence your cell phones, not only now, but throughout all the sessions during the week. We thank you very much for that. And just uh, the slide that is up, I want you to note that there is a program app that you can, uh, you can get access to. And the social media is hashtag Pecora20. I'm Frank Kelly. I am with the US Geological Survey, Earth Resources Observation Science Center, Eros, here 16 miles north 
east of Sioux Falls. And on, on behalf of our 600 uh, employees up there, we welcome everybody to our backyard. So again, thank you so much for being here. And I wanna thank Sioux Falls for being a great host and uh, having the conference here this week. The 20th Pecora is a wonderful opportunity to be informed about roles, applications, and opportunities to, youth, to use Earth observations, observing a changing Earth, signs for decisions, and the favorite words, monitoring, assessment, and projection. You're gonna hear a lot more about that during this week. And there's been a lot of work to get us to a great place to be able to have those kinds of discussions. The program has been assembled by steering committee chairs, Bruce Quirk, who is not here, and Tom Holm, who is here. And I wanna thank uh, Tom. And the technical program committee chairs are Martha Anderson, Jess Brown, and Jennifer Rover, and it spans a broad set of topics from the applications of satellites and other Earth observations to monitor, assess, and perform projections for future land and water resources. To big data, we're gonna have sessions on big data and analytical technologies related to that and util utilizing satellite data. Please immerse yourself in the symposium. We'll get started here in just a second with Andrea and help us make this week a success for everybody who is here. Oh, went one too far. I now wanna ask um, Andrea Travnik who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Water and Science at the Department of Interior to say a few words, but before I give you the podium, I need to mention she's from North Dakota, and we do not hold that against her. Even though North Dakota State <laughs> did lose to South Dakota State, <laughs> she's been very gracious about that for the, for the past couple of days. Um, Dr. Travnik has more than a decade of research and work experience within the natural resources environment, working with energy, agriculture, communication, aviation, and public policy fields, and has negotiated water issues at state, federal, international, and tribal levels. Dr. Travnik has ties to the Dakotas, as I mentioned, but she was also appointed as a senior policy advisor to Governors Hoven and Dalrymple in North Dakota. Dr. Travnik also has experience working for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, an environmental consulting firm in Bismarck, North Dakota, and also Ducks Unlimited. You can ask her about that later. She holds a PhD in natural resources management communication, and has professional experience working in private, public, and nonprofit sectors. Andrea, welcome to PCORA 20. Well, thank you for that welcome, I think, since, uh, <laughs> no, really excited to be here in uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, even though there is that little rivalry between uh, North Dakota State, um, but we did beat USD this last weekend okay. up in Fargo, so I just want to drop that as well. Um, but no, seriously, uh, really excited to be here. Came in from uh, Washington, D.C. Well, I did hit a little stop at NDSU this weekend. I did go to the Bison game and was at the, the USD game. Um, but so got in uh, yesterday morning and was able to get a tour um, with uh, Frank's team up at Eros. So just like I said, excited to be here with all of you. I know how important it is to um, you know, be here with land, use, land set users and experts, not only from the Department of Interior, but from other federal agencies, universities, and industries. Um, so with my tour yesterday, uh, it was just really good for me to, to get an overview since he went over my background a little bit. 
uh, where a lot of natural resource expertise, and we have used, in the governor's office, we did use a lot of the remote sensing and Landsat information. Uh, we talked about a little bit of my water expertise, and while I was in North Dakota, we used a lot of the imagery um, with Landsat for the floods. Um, so I was pretty active on the Devil's Lake issues, Red River Valley issues, Missouri River. So I just know how important having that, that continuous imagery is um, to decision-making processes. Uh, so yesterday when I was up there, I got an overview of um, his three branches that we have up there at Eros. Uh, everything from our observatory sciences, data services, science and application. So that's looking at everything from the technology advancements, how we archive, how we process, dissemination of the data, um, and also coming down to interpreting it and decision-making processes. Um, so since I've been on board about four months, moved from Bismarck to DC, thought I'd just go over some of the themes. I've had a you know, few meetings um, on all this so far, um, but some of the themes that I've walked away with is the importance of the Landsat imagery and the importance of having the continuous satellite imagery from the past, the present, and into the future as changes occur worldwide. Also, the importance of the, the calibration and validation of the data being collected. I know that's a big topic here this week. Uh, the imagery and information collected is important at not only the local, regional, national, and international levels, but also we've seen an increase in the usage of the information, too, across the federal government um, and globally. Uh, I know that there's been a lot of discussion, too, moving forward on Landsat and the, and the future missions, so we need to continue to stay in touch with our users, reviewing and determining the user needs, and the use of remote sensing for the missions. Uh, so whether that's discussing the spatial, spectral, and thermal data, I know I sat in a little bit of the discussions this morning, and that seemed to be uh, quite the topic of what that's going to look like for Landsat 9 and in the future for possibly 10. Um, and then one of the topics we ended with yesterday on the tour uh, was the concept of LC map. Uh, so looking at the land change, monitoring, assessment, and projection. So just how important uh, how the data can be collected and analyzed for various uses and is readily available for everybody. And besides Eros, I want to let you know that I have gone out to Goddard Space Flight Center, so have met with NASA, so working on the continued collaboration and cooperation with them as well. Uh, we'll be having my first uh, Sustainable Land Imaging Joint Steering Committee next week as we're looking at how to move forward from Landsat 9. We're looking forward to that in 2020. Um, but then also, what does it mean moving forward? Uh, so, uh, since we are starting to have those meetings, those discussions, I uh, look forward to any feedback that any of you might have. I know that we've got our USGS folks here, um, NASA, um, so looking for any of the discussions that you might think are important as we move forward. Uh, and with that, I just want to, again, on behalf of the Department of Interior, I want to thank you for allowing me to be here with you today. Uh, Department of Interior is committed to the Landsat mission and um, working with all of you. I did want to bring one update from the Department of Interior. Uh, last night, the White House did announce that we um, have a name for the Assistant Secretary for Water and Science. Uh, many of you might recognize the name. It's Tim Petty, who actually was a Deputy Assistant Secretary and Acting Assistant Secretary during uh, George W. Bush administration. So just wanted to make sure that you guys had that latest update. Um, and again, just want to thank you for having me here today. Thank you so much, Andrea. In four months, you've, uh, you've done a lot to immerse yourself into this community, and uh, we really appreciate your efforts to uh, go forward and do that. So uh, let's, let's thank Andrea again one more time. So moving on to an opening keynote, I'm going to introduce um, Barb Ryan as our keynote speaker. Barb is the Secretariat Director of the Intergovernmental Group on Earth Observations in Geneva, Switzerland. She became Director of GEO in 2012 and has worked to integrate Earth observations around the world into, single, into a single comprehensive system that uses coordinated data to understand how environmental factors impact human life. In 2008, she served as the director of the World Meteorological Organization Space Program. And prior to her work at the WMO and GEO, 
She was the Associate Director of Geography for the USGS, where she was responsible for the USGS remote sensing activities, geography, and civilian mapping programs, of course, including Landsat satellites when she had her time with USGS. It's during that time that she led an effort to change the decade-old Landsat data policy to full and open access to the data, an action that has resulted in nearly 70 million scenes being downloaded globally to date. Do you have other numbers? Okay. I'm going to give you some extra scenes, Barb. Okay. Barb, when she was Associate Director for Geography, was essentially the boss out here for Eros. Though I didn't get a chance to work with her uh, dur during that time frame, uh, she left just prior to when I assumed uh, uh, my responsibilities. But our paths have crossed in, in some other uh, very interesting ways. And I guess we, we want to welcome you back, and we look forward to your keynote, and that you have a great week here like everybody else. Barb Ryan. slide if it does uh, 41. Um, so where? Uh, yeah, great. Wonderful. Uh, Frank, thank you very much. And boy, it uh, sure is a pleasure to be here. I think it's been uh, quite a while since I've been back to Sioux Falls. Uh, not so long since I've been back to uh, r South Dakota, Rapid City. There was a CS Committee on Earth Observation Satellite meeting there a couple weeks ago, and so I had an opportunity to get into that. Um, yeah, you know, it, it's funny because I was uh, at the Department of Interior and USGS when uh, we were able to change the Landsat data policy, but I can tell you this whole week is a commemoration to the whole Landsat program, and there are certainly uh, people in the audience that uh, spent many more years and way longer uh, than I did. I was in the position for eight years. Uh, of course, Bruce Quirk, Jay Fuquay, R.J. Thompson, I mean, just a lot of, Sam Goward, you're going to be acknowledging him later on, Jim Irons, uh, my goodness, just think about the people that spent all of their careers uh, trying to get this data policy changed. So uh, for me, it was just an amazing uh, amazing time to be in the position at that time. Um, but, but here for this keynote, it really is talking about terrestrial observations coming of age. I mean, really, finally coming of age. And so the key messages right up front uh, are that there really have been tremendous accomplishments over the last 50 uh, plus years with terrestrial observations from space. Collaboration, though, at national, regional, and international levels is absolutely essential. Um, we in GEO talk about hyper-partnering. The Association of Investigative Journalists calls it radical sharing. I mean, really, just radical sharing of information at the national level, regional level, and international level. Uh, clearly, broad open data policies must be further advanced to leverage existing and planned investments in Earth observations and geospatial data. We'll come back to that. And then lastly, and really it's the subject of the talk, is that the progress in atmospheric observations over, again, similar amount of time, 30, 40, some people might argue 100 years, uh, really could serve as a model for terrestrial observations if we really want to achieve what I would call true Earth system modeling for societal benefit. So. In a snapshot, the slides are hopefully going to support each one of those uh, key messages. Um, but think about the progress over the last 50, uh, 50 years. I, um, you know, the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites, we call them the Space Coordination Arm of GEO. Uh, they've got a, a database now uh, that um, 
coming out of the meeting in Rapid City, I think more than 300 civilian satellites, a, a thousand, almost a thousand instruments flying on 300 civilian satellites. You know, if you look at just the middle resolution data, and I'm sorry, I don't have a slide for it, but with Lance, the history of Landsat, the introduction of the Sentinel series, you guys know the numbers better than me. You know, projections are every four or five days same spot on the earth being uh, covered by these two satellites. I mean, you know, we would have dreamed 50 years ago, 34, whatever, 37 years ago, first Landsat satellite every 16 days and every eight days, we would have dreamed to have that kind of coverage. And so it is here now, um, uh, but we've got more to do. Um, there clearly has been improved coordination of data providers not just on the space side, but on the in situ or ground based side too. You know, just within GEO, work across seven continents, eight societal benefit areas. We've been around for 12 years. Um, more than 400 million resources are discoverable and accessible. And a lot of that is clearly Landsat information, increasing numbers with the Sentinel series that they're coming in. But those 400 million resources aren't just space-based information, uh, but a, a lot of work is now going into having these, this, uh, this information at our fingertips. And there's increased, be, I would say and argue, because of that increased exposure to the data and the information itself, there's an increased awareness and use of Earth observations across all sectors and across all industries. We happen to call them societal benefit areas, and they're shown here all the way from biodiversity and ecosystem sustainability out to water resources management. Clearly, climate touches every single one of these societal, uh, societal benefit areas. Um, but uh, it can't get done without open data for the benefit of humankind. So a little while ago, a couple years ago at our meeting down in Mexico City, we worked with the Committee on Scientific Data, CoData, to put this report together, the value of open data sharing. And it just marches through why it's good for the economy, why it's good for society at large, research and innovation, education and governance. Um, for all of you who worked on the open data sharing for Landsat, <clears throat> I wish you could be in my shoes. There's hardly a meeting that I go to anywhere in the world without some young researcher coming up or a mid-career researcher saying, I no longer have to buy that data. And so all of my intellectual energy can actually go into the research, the study that I'm trying to do rather than the 80% time of the entire research project that I spent trying to access the data, manipulate that data, look at it over time, you know, for this little postage stamp on the uh, Earth's surface, and then finally start the actual study. So, uh, so it, is, uh, it is amazing. Um, and of course, you've seen the statistics. Um, oh, Frank, you're right. This graph does say 70. Uh, uh, million scenes. I had 42 in my mind. So before the open data policy, 53 scenes a day. After the open data policy, 5,700 scenes a day to this day are being downloaded of Landsat data. And so when we think about the policy implications of a graph like this, um, if the first Landsat satellite went up in 1972, then of course 1972 is going to be somewhere over there on, uh, on this graph. We were asking the wrong question. The question should have been, how can you justify the hundreds of millions of dollars that went into those Landsat satellites and you were only distributing, we were only distributing 53 scenes a day. So that's a tremendous investment. It, in fact, for the 30 years of the history, it wouldn't have even shown up on this graph for the distribution and the download of Landsat. In fact, I think it, um, it was Sam who said at the time, um, the best uh, archives around the world are probably using two or 3% of the archives, two or 3% of the archives when it should have been just the opposite, 97 or 98 percent of the archives. But I think, and Andrea, this is going to be so important from a Department of Interior perspective, particularly in this administration, it's not just the education and the capacity building, those things that you saw in that previous graph, but it's this number. 
that data policy created $1.7 billion, this is a 2011 numbers, in one year, $1.7 billion to the US economy, $400 million elsewhere for a global total of 2.1 billion, which far exceeded the four and a half or $5 million that we were taking in from selling those 53 scenes a day. So we were hoping the numbers came out this way. Uh, so this global total far exceeds the millions of dollars that we were making. And it certainly would be a, a travesty to turn your back on this economic return because it's largely in the private sector, value added products and services that come in off this government data to in fact grow jobs in the economy. So uh, really, and, and I, what we have argued in a couple of weeks ago at the Geoplanary in Washington, DC, okay, this was a 2011 analysis done by the Landsat Advisory Committee, um, but I'm convinced that Europe with the Sentinel data uh, policies will see these same kinds of numbers. It may take a couple years to, you know, kind of nurture the community to start those downloads. <coughs> excuse me, but uh, the, the economic return is in the use of the data, not the, not the data itself. Um, still talking about this tremendous progress that's been made, uh, new platforms and, uh, and analytics. Uh, you probably or certainly will see more about this um, this week. Uh, the Australian uh, Data Cube, calibrated to surface reflectance, single uniform standard along, allows the uh, comparison uh, through time, through the uh, Australian data cube, every unique observation kept included for analysis, uh, creating just really intense, um, um, intense time series uh, work. So over uh, every single pass that would have uh, gone over the, uh, the continent of Australia, uh, pulled into their national computer center, uh, pixel by pixel, as those previous uh, animations showed, because the continent's moving north, and so a pixel today isn't geographically the same place it was, um, you know, 20 years ago when the analysis was done. And so we're finally, with this advancement, uh, this is part of the story for terrestrial observations uh, coming, uh, coming of age. Again, um, uh, from my perspective, just a, f a phenomenal, uh, phenomenal story with the work uh, that Australia has done here. They can drill into this one particular uh, part, the Mendeni Lakes, and uh, for every 25 meter square area of the entire continent, say, show me every pixel that's always been wet uh, over that time frame. show me every pixel that's always been dry, show me every pixel that's been sometimes wet and sometimes dry. In this area alone, 40 billion observations down to 15 minutes of, uh, of processing time. Uh, they brought in 27 years of data, 25 meter resolution. If you had to pay, Four hundred and fifty or five hundred dollars a scene for three hundred thousand scenes for Australia. Um, that's why we weren't doing these analyses. These would have been a third of the cost of the satellite just to do an analysis like this. So for the entire continent, down to three hours of compute time. So Australia chose with a number of their partners to bring it in uh, to a national computer center and work with their water agency. Uh, and, and actually uh, land surface uh, temperature too. And I think this is uh, an animation that's pretty uh, impressive for uh, uh, part of time in 2015 uh, over, uh, over this seasonal uh, change. So again, continental scale analyses that can be done uh, with this information. Australia chooses to bring it into their National Computer Center. Uh, let's look at the work that the Joint Research uh, Center is doing. Uh, Alan Bellward's in the audience somewhere here with uh, the Global Surface Water Explorer. So likely similar algorithms, water detect algorithms, um, and instead of using a National Computer Center, has cho chosen uh, to do it globally on Google Earth Engine, 60,000 computers around the world. Uh, Alan and I were at a meeting uh, 
a um, couple months ago, and he said, you know, there's a really unique thing that I saw in looking at this uh, imagery, and it's some ponds north of Lubbock, Texas. And so, you know, for anybody kind of from this part of the world, uh, put in conservation ponds for either fishing or birding or whatever, uh, and very evident in analyses like this where those ponds are, again, pixel by pixel, um, with a, a, a shading pattern for, again, um, propensity or frequency of water, uh, graphing it to show when an area was entirely dry for 20 or 30 years, when a pond went into being and uh, then it was wet from there, uh, there on, 32 year water history. Again, one pixel, one pond. I mean, landscape change and landscape analysis that we just were not able, uh, able to do before. Uh, superimposed uh, on this particular image um, where uh, the landscape for which those ponds occur and then uh, again color coded with frequency for when they've had water and when they haven't. These are water algorithms, whether it's your National Computer Center, Google Earth Engine, facilitated by broad open data, likely mostly Landsat now, but Sentinel data will be pulled in. Uh, and, um, and, and that was water. Some, also, some other work that's being done by the Joint Research Center and uh, Martino Pesarazzi is the global human settlement layer. Um, again, website at the bottom, um, looking uh, again at just uh, human settlement over the in entire globe. Clearly, still a lot of black areas are your uninhabited areas. Those white areas are your high density urban areas. The cyan color are the low density settlements, but still with a lot of night lights. I think this is the NASA night light product showing a wealthier parts of the globe. And the red areas are high density settlements, but with no night lights whatsoever. So again, in a snapshot, whether we start to drill down into uh, Europe uh, or Asia uh, or uh, the Americas, uh, just real quickly, you can see both formal and informal settlements all facilitated uh, by this imagery. And so that's urban areas, and now um, can't leave without the story from uh, Matt Hansen's work with the Global Forest Watch. Uh, again, just a snapshot, a little area in Angola with forest loss uh, from 2000 to 2013, forest gain, and then uh, the change over that time frame. So I guess <clears throat> what I would uh, argue uh, is whether it's a water algorithm, whether it's an urban area algorithm, whether it's a forest algorithm, um, whether it's soil moisture, whether it's land surface temperature, anything that we can observe from space, why isn't it being incorporated in to whether it's the data cubes out there with the data we've got, whether it's uh, um, you know the Google Earth 60,000 uh, computers, um, the work uh, Andrea mentioned, uh, LC Map that's going on here at Eros. There are tremendous technological advancements that I think are just right at the cusp for really bringing terrestrial observations into where atmospheric observations have been. So let's just transfer real quick to the uh, atmospheric uh, observations as a, as a story. Clearly, a lot of in situ uh, observations. This is the International Surface Pressure Data Bank that exists. Um, we talk often in the meteorological community about a geostationary quilt. Um, so if you look at this graph, it's a little complicated, but from uh, 1975 up to about 2012, and then latitude around the bottom. And with uh, ex the exception of some mid-latitude areas around uh, 60 degrees north, it's pretty good global, global coverage of those geostationary satellites. Um, we have that or will have it on the terrestrial side uh, very, very soon. So you could start to really look at some global pictures of what's happening. This just happens to be work that Meteo France did with uh, five of those geostationary satellites. 
But the story for me is that there have been tremendous advances in global and regional weather forecasts. Um, so again, this is uh, anomaly correlations. Um, you look at uh, time along the bottom of the graph from 81 to 2013, 2014. Each color are the, the different forecasts. Blue at the top is the three-day forecast. Uh, red seven-day green is, uh, uh, um, no, that's, that's actually wrong. Three-day, five-day, seven-day, and then 10-day is in yellow. That legend doesn't look right all of a sudden. Um, but look at that. Fowl, uh, let's just take the, the three-day forecast now, which out in 2013, 2014 is almost at 97 or 98% uh, accurate. And if you fowl any number back to the beginning of when this, uh, these anomalies were starting uh, to be uh, calculated. The, the uh, top of the graph is the northern hemisphere, the bottom of any color is the southern hemisphere, and every single number is better than the previous estimate back 20 or so years ago. But, but look at the late 90s and 2000, where in almost every single forecast, the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere numbers come together. That was due in t almost entirely to the introduction of satellite observations. In the early years, you would have had only in situ observations. There's not much land mass in the southern hemisphere. And so as soon as satellite observations started coming in, the forecasting ability improved immensely over time. And so I would argue that the work that's happening right now with the Australian Data Cube, uh, with uh, our global uh, water explorer, with the global human settlement layer, with LC map, we are right now at that 1990, late 1990, 2000 era, where we're really bringing in terrestrial observations in a true global, global sense. Um, so uh, again, whether uh, it's uh, dust, atmospheric transport from, uh, uh, for, from forest fires, uh, from dust storms, uh, from pollution, um, what, what facilitated this entire effort were just a handful of centers around the world. Uh, ECMWF, that graph before on the anomalies came from them, the UK Met Office, uh, CMA, KMA, and JMA, uh, NSIP or NCAR here in the United States. I mean, they're Australia shown with their Bureau of Meteorology work. You know, there's not a center in every single country around the world. We don't have 194 of these. And so I guess what I would like to plea uh, to this work is that with Australia, uh, with JRC, uh, with Aeros Data Center, um, it is now time that we could operationally adopt what these numerical weather uh, modeling centers did in the last 30 or 40 years with a handful of centers. They may have different approaches, uh, but if the algorithms are shared, if your analyses are shared between and among yourselves, we can see the same kind of not only hindcasting, but hopefully forecasting and terrestrial observations that I would argue the meteorological community has in fact seen. So that's the plea. I would argue if you really want to get to true earth system modeling, we need it. So you've got the outputs of those modeling centers on the atmospheric side that would be the inputs to your terrestrial observations that then would be the outputs to the ocean community stepping up and doing the same thing. And if we could do this at a global scale, you could get to true Earth system uh, modeling. Uh, Frank said we talk about a global Earth observation system of systems. It's on the, it's on the data side. While our vision has been linking the atmospheric observations, the terrestrial observations, and the marine observations together, it's going to take a significant push from the terrestrial community and oceanic community to, uh, to help make, uh, to make this happen. Um, but it is, in fact, a changing uh, landscape. Um, you know, we have been about data 
and pushing that data to users. We're starting to see a pull now from users for that information, but the bridge, uh, the bridge isn't uh, entirely completed. We've got to kind of marry this user-centric approach with what our community has traditionally done, which has been a, a data-centric approach, and um, now's the time uh, to do it. How we in GEO are doing it, how you as members of GEO have done it as a few years ago, adopted um, what we will call the globally relevant engagement priorities of the Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Agreement, and uh, Sendai. And what I'd like to do is just for a couple slides, drill down into those global uh, 17 Sustainable Development Goals because in each of your countries, it's largely going to be your census bureaus or your statistical agencies that are monitoring progress. They may or may not know about Earth observations and geospatial data. So what we've been trying to do is work with the UN Statistics Commission uh, in New York to say in this publication about transforming our world, the 2030 plan for global action, is that we've got to bring Earth observations and geospatial data into the uh, into the equation for ensuring national ownership, supporting and tracking that progress. Um, with NASA, with JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency, and with NP uh, team, has, we call it the Earth Observations for SDG team, looked across a number of uh, easily accessible products for each of those 17 goals. That's this matrix. Um, they put this report together just recently, which are case studies on how Earth observations can respond to those SDGs. This is a living document, so we're looking for uh, for more examples of that. The website is there. And so, uh, so I would argue that we've got to continue to bridge this policy mandate with either climate, the SDGs, or the Sendai framework to get politicians knowledgeable or at least aware of the role that Earth observations can play in this field. Um, and some work that we're doing, Brad Dorn's in the audience, has been instrumental in the GeoGlam effort. Uh, we started issuing the first uh, crop monitor for early warning in February. Um, this obviously uh, South Africa, where you're looking at major food crops and then and drivers um, of of conditions and and why those uh, drivers existed. Clearly, if you want to meet the sustainable development goal of zero hunger, it can in fact be informed uh, by that, uh, by those, uh, that earth observation uh, information. So producing, openly disseminating this information will help actually start meeting, uh, meeting that goal. You know that about 94% of the world agricultural areas are covered either by uh, AMOS, the Agricultural Marketing Information uh, System, uh, these uh, early warning countries uh, or the countries that we're already working with. So we have, there are, there are in fact drivers out there for this information. And again, for many of you in the audience, you know it largely would have been uh, a, an agricultural driver for the Landsat program uh, when it was uh, first uh, dreamed of in the late 60s and uh, early, um, uh, early 70s. Um, but, but look at these uh, numbers. This is an aggregation of wheat production forecasts. So forecasts for 2010, 2011, and 2012. So what you see are the forecasts in pink, and then of course the price uh, in blue, and there's an inverse relationship so that when uh, the forecast is high uh, and uh, the costs are gonna be low. And I guess what I would, are, and so this is through the growing season, and so look at the discrepancy in these numbers from the beginning of the growing season to the end of the growing season. And how come we aren't using our knowledge of Earth observations much more in advance at the beginning of the growing season so that we could in fact level out these price curves. So we again would argue if you want to create a food secure world, you're gonna have to level out these car, uh, these curves so there's just not as much speculation in terms of uh, uh, this entire industry, uh, glo global uh, industry. So 
uh, still very much a need uh, for uh, earth observations. So in closing, um, tremendous accomplishments over the last 50 years with terrestrial observations from space. Uh, many of you, maybe all of you in the room have contributed in some way to those uh, accomplishments. Uh, but collaboration is still needed. It's needed at the national level. So the space agencies, the geospatial agencies are talking to their statistical agencies who are responsible for measuring and monitoring those uh, global goals at the regional level, continental scale, I would argue, and clearly at the international level. Again, like uh, conferences like this, um, hyper-partnering, radical sharing is just so important. Uh, we still have a lot of work to do globally on broad open data sharing. Um, they've got, it's got to be further, uh, further advanced to leverage those investments. It goes back to us just asking the wrong question. How could we justify the investment into Landsat? How could Europe have invested, uh, justified an investment into the Sentinel series without a broad open data policy? Uh, and yet we just fooled ourselves by that. Um, and then progress in atmospheric observations, I think, uh, can in fact serve as a model for where we as a terrestrial community to go, uh, need to go. And I'd argue that the only way we're going to be able to reach that 2030 agenda is true Earth system modeling, terrestrial, atmospherically, and oceanically, uh, because they're all, uh, all, uh, all, uh, all linked. So uh, we're fond of saying countries have borders, Earth observations don't. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, really uh, have appreciated this opportunity to just connect with old friends and meet some new ones. So thank you, Frank. <clears throat> I think uh, Barb has uh, thrown down a gauntlet uh, to be looking at Earth system modeling, to be looking at the whole system. Uh, we have the right people here in this room to be able to do that, and let's do that this week. This is a great start to PCORA 20. Thank you, Barb. I'll let you go in just a second here. Um, the next session starts at 2.15, the technical session, so you have about uh, 30 minutes. And then uh, tomorrow and Thursday, the breaks will also be for 30 minutes. Remember, at the end of the day, today, at 5.30, starting at 5.30, in the exhibit hall, there will be an exhibitors and uh, poster session, and uh, hope to see, uh, see you there, and have a real good week. Thank you so much.